Good morning, I'm Christopher Haynes. This is a presentation on Heat Planet. If you want to make small changes, you can change the way you do, do things. If you want to make major changes, you have to change the way you see things. This is an invitation to take a stroll in the Paradigm Mountains and see differently. Today we are planning, designing, engineering, building, and managing our common demise. This is a quote by Scott Horst, the editor of Environmental Design and Construction in 2006, in which he was actually talking about the lack of the development of the industry, the green building industry. But in light of what I'm about to show you, it seemed a rather prophetic statement. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter commissioned Charles Keeling and the Scripps Institute to provide a report to the government on climate change with computer modeling and recommendations. The Keeling knew that 95% of the heat dynamics of the planet are controlled by water. However, he believed that those heat dynamics were too complex and too mate large for humans to have any impact on. Secondarily, the heat, the water dynamics were so incredibly complicated, he couldn't model them to meet Carter's requirements. So he left water as a, at least a primary item out of his modeling. Secondarily, he also knew that land management was the intervening factor between solar energy and warming of the atmosphere. But he felt that the, the planet was the planet and that the average values globally would not actually change. So he omitted land management from the modeling. This is important because 10 years later, the IPCC picked up the Keeling model and adopted it. They have made it more sophisticated, they've had some extra feedback loops, but it does, it no, it does not include the, either the land management or the basic water dynamics. This is a story about sunshine. The sun has been worshipped as a god from ancient times. It has been an inspiration to, to literature and to poetry, and it's been an inspiration to, just for a run on the beach. The sun emits short-wave, high-frequency radiation as energy waves. The shorter the wavelength, the more hazardous the, way, the energy form to life, both human and other species. The central, central curve on this, this slide is the luminous dynamics of the sun, which is the visible light spectrum that we see. The upper curve, documenting the, um, <coughs> me, documenting the intensity of the waves, is the chemical intensity of those waves of the upper ranges which are dangerous. And the lower curve is the thermal dynamics of the in thermal intensity, documenting the heat generation of the longer wavelengths at the bottom of that curve. That sunshine energy transfer, tr transfers through the atmosphere to Earth. For our purposes, we're concerned with the bottom seven miles of Earth, the troposphere, which includes all of the weather patterns that affect the planet, all the storms and all the weather and the greenhouse gases accumulated in the troposphere. Just above the troposphere is the tropopause, which is a isothermic layer where the temperatures do not change, but they're almost 60 degrees, 60 degrees below zero centigrade. Um, and in the lower reaches of the stratosphere is the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from the, the dangerous shortwave radiation from the sun that I showed you in the previous slide. When the sunshine arrives on Earth, it does two basic things. The first of which we all know about is photosynthesis. It converts Solar, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water and energy into the basic sugars that are the base of the life uh, food chain for, all, for the whole planet. Uh, all the carbon in the atmosphere was once in, this, well, the, was once in the soil. The other thing that's important here is the leaf area index on the lower right here, um, which, which Documents it's a ratio of the leaf surface area 
to the footprint of the plant on the ground. The hard, lar larger the leaf area index, the more effective that plant is in converting the sunshine that reaches that, that area. Uh, if you think that a mowed lawn, at very mowed short, is a leaf area index of about one, and it's probably more than that. As you get taller plants and then into shrubs and trees, the leaf area index rises dramatically. And those plants are much more effective in converting the sunshine that comes from the sun into food, food sources. The second very important thing that plants do with sunshine is transpire water. This is a figure of the Amazon River Basin, Amazon Valleys, and the water vapor rising off of that forest. 1% um, of the water that's brought to that plant tr tree is goes into photosynthesis. About 5% is used for growth, and the other 94% simply evaporates. That requires about two-thirds of the energy that the sun provides to that, that tree in order to produce at negative atmosphere, or about 15 atmospheres, um, to allow the hydraulic forces to get the water to the top of the tree and transpire it into the atmosphere. That vapor transpired from the trees then absorbs heat from its surrounding area to evaporate it, and that provides a cooling effect. We'll get to that in a minute. This is a, a figure from NASA. It's simply the energy from the sun. Um, about 30% is reflected back to the atmosphere. In this one, about 20% is absorbed by the atmosphere. And the other 50% is absorbed by the, by the planet. The surface of the planet is warmed by the sun, but the temperatures to which it is warmed are relatively low. The result is it re-emits that energy as infrared heat waves that are then transported and to the reflected into the atmosphere and cause the warming of the atmosphere. The atmosphere absorbs infrared radiation from the Earth's sun-warmed surface. This is from the American Meteorological Society. So we know heat from the planet warms the atmosphere. Here we have a slide of a drained field, a dry condition, and a wet, moist condition. In the case of the drained, dry field, about 60 to 70 percent of the solar energy is converted into sensible heat. Sensible heat is the heat you can measure with a thermometer. The more sensible heat, the higher the temperature. Um, about 10 to 20 percent is, is evaporated, transp transpired through the plants. In the wet condition, only 5 to 10 percent of that energy is converted into sensible heat, and 70 to 80 percent is, is converted into tra evapotranspiration and therefore causing cooling. So we have a very dramatic difference with water available to su sunlight and what, how, much, how much temperature rise we have. And in some cases, the transpiration will actually overcome the heat source and will be total cooling. This is experienced, and for anybody that's been here, in a walk in the woods. Mostly dark, some light, some sunlight coming through, dappling the, the wood um, under a warm, sunny day. It's still a cool, very pleasant environment, quite moist and very lovely. However, if you were to take a walk on this field in the upper left, your feet are, are protected. There's some shade there. Um, and your, there, there's transpiration which is providing cooling at the surface of the, of the soil, but you are to protect, not protected. Alternatively, if you are walking through the sand, you know exactly how hot that would be, or in the upper right, walking across the parking lot. And the lower right is a plaza, and te theoretically designed for people, but if you look at it, it's pretty clear why nobody's in, in it. This can be observed as well in the other side. When the sun warms objects, they re-radiate that heat. The upper left is a 4x4 four four wooden post of supporting a mailbox. And you can see that the sun has warmed the wood, the wood has re-emitted that heat, and melted the snow in a rather circular pattern around the post. 
The lower right is a double wooden post with two mailboxes. The center low bottom is a telephone pole, a larger pole, but the physics are the same. The upper right is a stone which has been warmed by the sun and again melted the snow around it. And the lower left is a cast iron fire hydrant. Now to get into the actual science of this, we're going to start with reflectivity or what we call albedo. The reflected energy from the sun is the energy that is basically leaves the system and is no, no longer an issue in how, the, how our, our environment and our climate. Um, if you notice in the second line, um, snow and fresh fallen, f f fresh fallen snow is a reflectivity of 75 to 95 percent. So a fair bit of that, that energy is reflected out. On the bottom of that, we'll notice blacktop, asphalt roading, 5 to 10 percent is reflected. We'll come back to that. There's a reason I'm mentioning it. So everything has a reflectivity, and some of the energy that is reflected off of objects is, is, is not turned into anything. The second item of importance is emissivity. The emissivity is the tendency of a material to re-radiate the heat that it absorbs. If it has a low emissivity, it gets hot. If it has a high emissivity, it never achieves very high temperatures because that heat is reflected before it causes heating in, in it. On the last line in the bottom is wood, a 0.82 to 0.89 emissivity. So that's the reason those fence posts never get very warm, but they emit the heat and melt the snow. About a third of the way down on the left-hand side, you'll notice polished copper. Copper is 0.02 to 0.05 emissivity, which means it absorbs most of the heat that it gets. In that case, a copper roof on, an, on a building would get extremely hot. But likewise, a copper kettle on the stove would, would absorb most of the heat from the stove um, without emitting much and therefore be more efficient in boiling water. And housewives in previous generations would spend time polishing their copper kettles because they knew as the, if they didn't keep them clean, the emissivity would rise and it would take more wood and more time to, to boil water in the kettle. The next concept is heat capacity. It's how much energy as heat a material can actually hold. The basic piece here is the specific heat, which tells you how much energy BTUs per pound, but it's done by weight. We don't normally think of materials by weight, we don't use them as weight. So it's more, more useful to think in terms of volume. And we have the heat capacity is BTUs as energy heat per unit volume per cubic foot. Um, to get there, you multiply the specific heat by the density, the weight of the object, and come up with heat capacity. You'll see here that water has a specific heat of 1, and almost everything else on this list, with two exceptions, are very low specific heats in the 0.1 to just over 0.2 range. Um, the exceptions are wood, which are in the 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, but the, res the, the result is that the, the metals with a very, very low specific heat, but still very high densities, they're very heavy, um, still have relatively high heat capacities. And we notice here asphalt, which is a specific heat of 0.22, a density of 132 pounds and a heat capacity of 29. We'll come back to that. That's the reason I'm pointing it out. On the upper right, you see the water with the highest heat capacity. The next three are steel, cast iron, and copper. And the fourth is aluminum, a much lighter material, but still fairly high heat capacity capability. The lower right is a plaza in Czechoslovakia. You can see there's a thermal image that the white roofs are very hot, the building facades and the paving in the plaza are quite warm, and you can see the trees in the background are quite cool. <coughs> the concept of our hothouse or greenhouse atmosphere was developed by Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician and physicist in the 1800s, who was determined that if we didn't have an insulating atmosphere around the Earth, the temperatures would drop dramatically at night, and the Earth would be totally inhospitable. It could not support life because of the drastic movements from day to night temperatures. 
So he didn't understand the dynamics of that process, but he recognized that there must be some form of insulating the planet so that our temperature remained even, or relatively even. He was aware of studies that others had done on the heat trapping capacity of green glass boxes and uh, co compared the atmosphere to a hothouse or a greenhouse. Um, and we've had that terminology now for over uh, 200 years, uh, 100 years, 200 years. So this is NASA, but this is, this is EPA on the greenhouse effect. Again, it's like the NASA um, vision, the sun hitting a certain amount being um, reflected off, but the bulk of the energy is now warming the surface, which is warm, but not to very high temperatures compared to the 6,000 degrees of the sun. And that, those, those materials have higher emissivities, and they emit that energy into the atmosphere. We've been there. However, the greenhouse gases then capture that energy. They actually have high absorptivities and emissivities, so they absorb and re-emit that energy basically to each other. The higher density, the easier that it becomes. And as a result, additional heat is reflected back to the, to the, to the sun, to the earth. And we have what we call the greenhouse effect. So these are the greenhouse gases. 99% of our atmosphere is uh, oxygen and nitrogen, and the other 1% is a whole series of other materials. A very few of them are high emissivity and high um, absorptivity, are the triatomic uh, um, molecules. Water is actually very common, about 40,000 parts per million, but it's the least effective of the greenhouse gases. The CO2, the methane, the nitrous oxide, and the O3 um, <coughs> um, ozone are quite are the, the greenhouse gases that we know, as these in fact are defined by their ability to absorb and reflect heat. We have a couple of unnatural man-made chemicals which are also very effective, but they're also very rare in the atmosphere. Thank you. So we know heat from the planet warms the atmosphere. Greenhouse gas, gas, greenhouse gases exacerbate warming but they do not generate the heat that causes it. Luke Howard, 1772 to 1864, was as a child fascinated by the sky and clouds and weather and spent hour upon hour just watching the sky. At age 30, he walked onto a stage of the Eschician Society, which is a small science club in London, in an evening in December of 1802 and gave a speech called The Transformation of Clouds, in which he defined the classification system of clouds that we still use today. His interest was, was so great that he continued that, that work, and in 1818 published a study he had done on the climate of London, in which he was the first to identify and analyze an urban heat island. London, at the time, in the census in 1800, it was just under 1.1 million people. It was the largest city in Europe, or very nearly so, very close to any other. It was a hub for youth, and particularly women, largely looking for service jobs as nannies and such. It was a massive migration, gave neighborhoods specific qualities, which changed over time as people came from different sectors. It hit 1.4 million by 1815, and nearly 3.2 million by 1860. So, Howard's discussion of his, his understanding of urban heat islands developed as he looked far, further into his data. That the superior temperature of the bodies of men and animals is capable of elevating, in a small proportion, the mean heat of a city or populous tract of country in a temperate latitude is a proposition that will scarcely be disputed. But the proportion of warmth which is induced in the city by the population must be far less considerable than that which emulates from the fires, the greater part of which are kept up for the very purpose of preventing the sensation of the escape of heat from our bodies. 
A temperature equal to that of spring is hence maintained in the depth of winter in the included part of the atmosphere, which as it escapes from the houses is continually renewed. Another and more considerable portion of heat, heated air is continually pouring into the common mass from the chimneys. To which lastly we have to add the heat diffu diffused in all directions from foundries, breweries, steam engines, and other manufacturing and culinary fires. The real matter of surprise when we contemplate so many sources of heat in the city is that the effect on the thermometer is not more considerable. The greatest effect is in winter, the lowest effect in the spring, consistent with his supposition that due largely to the fires. However, the temperature difference increased again in June. It is probable, therefore, that the sun in summer actually warms the air of the city more than it does that of the country around. This is the heart of the understanding of urban heat islands. Solar energy is warming our built environment greater than, more than it is warming the vegetation in the rural and suburban areas. He further recognized the clear radiation from the country versus vertical city surfaces reflecting heat to each other, free winds in the country versus winds impeded by construction in the city prevented the cooling, and the country's inexhaustible store of moisture, that was his term, to supply evaporation while the city's moisture is quickly depleted even after a rain. When we consider that radiation to the sky, the contract of fresh breezes, and evaporation are the three critical impediments to the daily accumulation of heat at the surface, we shall perceive that a city like London ought to be more heated by the summer sun than the country around it. He further recognized shading and radiation effects of one wall to another, the impact of street width and its orientation in the re rela relation to the sun, the temperature difference that built up over the course of the day. He then noted that the same pattern works on a yearly scale, in which London gains and loses heat more slowly than the country over the course of the year. So, a common modern interpretation of heat islands by Lisa Garland is actually quite a good book in which she discusses her analysis of urban heat islands. Decreased evaporation, she does a study of the reduction in vegetation from rural to urban areas. Increased heat storage, Howard didn't actually talk about heat storage but in his discussions about radiating heat from one surface to another, he certainly understood that it existed. Heat, increased heat capturing radiation, this has to do with low reflectivities, in which case more heat is actually captured, and low emissivities, in which heat is not radiated, is, is not radiated off. Um, decreased convection, which is the wind that Howard discussed, anthropogenic heat, which is where he started, all the things that we do to add heat to our cities, and we have lots of sources and energy use that turn into heat that he wasn't, didn't have her at his time. And the systematic interactions. I think it's fair to say Howard probably hadn't figured out all the interactions in a system he has just identified and begin to analyze. We've learned surprisingly little in 200 years. The problem of heat islands is not so much what causes them, though we know that now, but they're, they're studied as islands. They're studied in isolation. Many studies focus on one city, and it's certainly understandable the city would get a study to find out how it's doing and what's, what's going on and where the issues are. <coughs> it's commoditized as a problem in need of a solution. New technology and sophistication, but very little connection. And it's business as usual. None of these studies question cities. Yet the IPCC has consistently underestimated the rate of warming. So we know, heat flat from the planet warms the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases exacerbate warming, but do not generate the heat that causes it. Heat generation by urban heat islands has been documented for 200 years. So this brings us down to a question of the utilization of solar energy. What happens to it once it reaches the Earth? Here we have a picture of marshland in Nevada, um, the Amazon basin, which you've seen, and other images of forests and wetlands um, in which we know what solar energy does when it reaches there. Or we have this. The built environment with little vegetation and 
Basically, everything is turned into heat. And that, this is the thermal image of a heat island. And if you can't read it, that is Detroit, Indianapolis, Chicago, and St. Louis, all combined together in one heat island. And to make matters worse, we talked about leaf area index in plants, which is an efficiency and effectiveness in how well plants capture solar energy and therefore can convert it, convert it into to, um, sugars. But we do the same thing in buildings. If you build a small house, say, say 1,800 square feet in one story, you, the surface area of the walls is approximately equal to the surface area of the roof, which means you have doubled the surface area on that site that is capturing energy and turning it into heat. If it's a five-story commercial building of standard size, the wall areas are approximately four times the roof. And if it's a 50-story office building, the wall areas are approximately 20 times the roof. So we have, in effect, a leaf area index, but it's working against us by increasing the geometry. We talk about the area of urban centers, but that's a footprint. We could easily have 10 or 20 or 30 times that much in surface area that is actually capturing sunlight. Now, some of it's in the shadows and doesn't actually see direct sun, uh, and certainly there are many other variables, but it's an important idea to consider. So, the growth of the urban footprint. In 1800, we had just about 4,000 square miles of city. By 2000, that was 136,000 square miles. Urban population from 1800 to 2000 grew from about 7 million to 2.8 billion, and in 2015 that then grew to 4, 4 billion. The greenhouse gas levels, were 282 parts per million in, in 1800, have risen to 369 parts per million in 2000, and 401 parts per million in 2015. So, urban area has increased 3,345% 3 in the 1800 to 2000. Urban population has increased 3,836%, and greenhouse gas levels have increased 30.85%. There's a decimal place in there. So we know, heat from the planet warms the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases exacerbate warming, but do not generate the heat that causes it. Heat generated by urban heat islands has been documented for 200 years, and urbanism has increased more than 100 times faster than greenhouse gas levels. A rural heat island. An island is, by definition, a piece of land surrounded by other, and obviously, as we talk about islands, that other is water. But it produces a fairly clean boundary line now, it may be tidal, and that boundary may move a little bit as tides go in and out, but basically the definition of where the island is is quite clear. However, this is an urban heat island. Where's the boundary? You can see that the urban heat island is defined as an urban center that is warmer than the boundary around it. But if the, bound if the physics that we've been talking about apply to the boundary around it, then we are underestimating the actual amount of heating that occur in the urban area because we're basically saying that anything around it is zero and it looks like that's not the case. So, what is the correct temperature of the bordering territory? Does this house on the upper right, which has stone steps, a one, one looks like one, habit, one ha inhabitant, um, and tile roof, very small, sitting on what we would call a drained field, if we go back to the slide about thermal, thermal uh, sen sensible heat from the sun, is this a heat island? The answer has to be yes. It's very small, it might be impossible to actually measure it, but yes, that's a heat island. It is making an impact on the area around it. And on the left we have a treehouse. Now this is wood, not concrete and stone, or, or tile, but the wood heats up, as we saw with the wood posts, and it emits that heat, so we haven't created it again. What we would totally ignore, but is in fact a heat island. This is just an interchange of an interstate 
somewhere in the U.S. West, I would guess. But look at the amount of roadway that is used to transfer car traffic from one road to another. The lower right and the upper left are simply roads. Um, but the lower left is the road in front of my house. Now, April of this year, we had a 14-inch snowstorm. And the snow plows plowed that snow to both sides of the road. And they were fairly large snowdrifts. This was taken several days or perhaps a week after that. And as you can see, the road at the snow, snow bank on the left, it appears to be fairly full. Now, maybe it has shrunk a little bit. But the snow bank on the right, which faces basically due north, on the north side, um, is almost gone. There's a little bit of snow there. So we talked about the reflectivity of a road surface, 0 0.5 to 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. We know that... I know this roadway is 24 feet wide. As a roadway, it's at least four inches deep, maybe six inches. I don't know that. Um, but we know asphalt has, is 132 pounds a cubic foot and a heat capacity of 29. We went through those, that's why I pointed those figures out. So it certainly appears that the sun is, war is warming that roadway, which is impacting the, melt the rate of melting snow on the north side. I do not know all the details of that physics, but we have 30,000 square miles of transportation infrastructure in this country. And if they're all doing what the roadway in front of my house is doing, we're generating an awful lot of heat just in the surface of those roads. Secondarily, the roads are built for cars. The internal temperature of an internal combustion engine in this cylinder is about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that heat is dissipated into the engine block usually used to be steel, but a lot of it is now done in aluminum. And the engine block is circumvented with a water jacket that absorbs the heat out of the, the metal and is sent, it sends it to a radiator where it can be cooled and then circulated back to keep the, the metal cool. But all of that heat, in one form or another, be, all of that energy becomes heat and it's dissipated to the atmosphere. So the amount of all the energy we use in transportation is basically simply heat being spread to the atmosphere. <coughs> now, what about land management? In the U.S. in 2012, according to the USDA, 40% of the land area, 915 million acres, is farmland, and about 181 million acres is corn, soybeans, and cotton. These are three crops that leave very large amounts of bare soil exposed to the sun. We went back to those figures I showed you on sunshine. And bare soil is 170 degrees, 107 degrees instead of the 90, 93 degrees of the uh, 94 degrees of the air temperature. So it had, was 13 degrees warmer than the air temperature. And here we have millions of acres of land that is largely exposed to the sunshine for generating heat. Now, as the crops grow, they shade it some, but the land directly is, is not covered. Worldwide. We have 349 million hectares, 862 million acres, of those three crops. Now, these are not the only crops that are bare, and, but they're simple targets to wrap your head around the scale of this problem. We're talking about millions and millions of hectares of land that is largely bare, simply generating heat when nothing is growing on it. This is Mount You notice this is 20, 2017, October at about 404 parts per million, which rises to 412 parts per million by the end of May. And then from the end of May to October, drops from 412 to about 405 and a half, perhaps. And that is directed by the growing season in the Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere has a lot more land area that is at great ground than the Southern Hemisphere. And while that while that is in the growing season, it is transpiring water, causing cooling, and generating, um, to taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into um, foodstuffs. Um, so, if we had more vegetation, that line going down from early June into October might actually go down farther than the rise from October to, to May. 
Now, studies done in the Canadian Prairie Provinces are proof of concept here. Um, in the 1970s, about 15 million acres was left fallow every year. For farmers believed that it was better to leave it to leave it bare and allow it to to recover. In fact, that's not true. But uh, that has now reduced into more present times to about two million two million hectares. So, looking at the time frame of the se the growing season when land would otherwise have been growing crops but has been left fallow. Um, it does not affect te temperatures in the other three seasons when this, is, this growing pit piece is not valid. Um, but in the summer, the summer maximum temperatures drop 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Humidity has risen 7%. The summer rain has increased 10 millimeters per decade. And there's a 6 watt per square meter summer cooling versus a 2.5 watt square per square meter warming from greenhouse gases. So the reduction in leaving land fallow and the increase in vegetation cover has directly increased the, the affected the climate in the area. We are also deforesting our lands. We're losing four to five million hectares a year to deforestation. That is turning lands that were producing sugars and transpiring water into bare land that is now just simply generating heat. This is mountaintop removal. The picture on the upper left shows the scale, the aerial photo shows the scale of this destruction, but it's a major amount of land that is simply turned into rubble, um, to doing absolutely nothing except generating heat. This is Queenstown in Tasmania, in Australia. Um, in 1881, they discovered silver and started mining in Queenstown. In 1892, they discovered copper, much better um, strain of copper. So they stopped the silver mining and, and moved on to the copper. The copper, however, was polluted with a great deal of sulfur. And in smelting the copper ore, it produced sulfur gases which generated sulfuric acid in the atmosphere and killed effectively every living thing in the valley. I was there in 1994, and it was absolutely landscape. It was just totally incredible to see it. But this environmental pollution is certainly leaving land area um, barren. In, in ways that we not, hadn't thought about. Desertification, we're losing according to the UN, 12 million hectares a year to desertification. The boat on the upper left, as you may know this picture, is several miles from the ocean now. That's, that lake is already completely um, evaporated. And the picture on the lower left is an image of a field growing crops, which is now turned into simply bare clay, cracked and dry, unable to grow anything. So we know, heat from the planet warms the atmosphere, greenhouse gases exacerbate warming, but do not generate the heat that causes it. Heat generation by urban heat islands has been documented for 200 years. Urbanism has increased more than 100 times faster than greenhouse gas levels. The same physics generate heat in non-urban areas. The destruction of biodiversity increases heat generation. Is it crazy to conclude that we have created what is effectively a global heat island? The growth of urbanism and other heat generating sources and the destruction of biodiversity are the true cause of global warming. Greenhouse and gases exacerbate this problem, but they do not cause it. This is a picture of Canberra, the capital of Australia. Um, the image gives you a sense of what this city is like. It's not a big city, it's 385,000 people. It was designed by Marion Mahoney and Walter Burley Griffin for a competition in 1913. They were both students, ex-students, of Frank Lloyd Wright. Marion Mahoney was a blooming genius, and many have credited her with things that Frank Lloyd Wright was otherwise credited with. But she was certainly the genius behind what Walter Burley, Burley Griffin was, was uh, credited with. The upper right is the American Embassy in Canberra. You can see by the way it's set that it's not a very stiff urban area. And the left, on the picture on the left, is the Canberra National Library. Um, so this is not what's considered a well-walkable, sustainable city. And Canberra does have its problems. However, it is 7 degrees Celsius, 12 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than urban areas two miles away. 